I hope we have a, an, an, an awesome little session here. This is one of the concurrent sessions happening right now at 1 o'clock uh, for the laboratory. So we're going to focus on some lab elements here. We've got a great panel uh, with us here today. We've got Dr. Reem from Harvard Partners, our own Frank Cockerell from Lab Medicine and Pathology, and Carl Gunter from University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Um, I think w the topic for today is really how the clinical, how does the clinical laboratory develop new workflows and processes while meeting those CLIA standards. A lot of these technologies have been in place in the research laboratories for many years, and we all know in the clinical laboratories it's not as easy as just flipping a switch and translating those methodologies into the CLIA lab. So we're really going to focus on how we meet those standards and how we bring this technology into the clinical laboratory. And hopefully, if there's time, we'll also touch on how do we convince payers of the need for this type of technology in the course of clinical care. So uh, if you were at my talk yesterday, you will remember that I get a little long in the tooth. And I've promised not to do that during this moderating session. So we're going to start uh, right with the program. Please hold all of your questions until the question and answer session at the end. So what that means is each speaker will come up, they'll give their talk, and then the next speaker will be introduced, give their talk, and then at the end we'll have an open Q&A session. One last thing to note there is we've been having some difficulty with the Wi-Fi here. So if you're using the conference app right now where you can feed questions in, try to do so, but it may not allow you to connect. And if it turns out that we're not able to get the questions up to the podium at the, uh, at the end of the session, we'll just have you all stand up and one at a time, of course, and shout out your, <laughs> your questions. This is a small enough group, so I think we'll be able to handle that. Clear? Yeah. All right, great. So our first speaker for today is Dr. Heidi Rehm, and she is the Chief Laboratory Director for the Laboratory of Molecular Medicine at the Partners Healthcare Center for Personalized Genetic Medicine. And she is an associate professor now, is that correct? Uh, a, a recent promotion and well-deserved. I know Heidi very well. She sleeps very little and works a lot. So it's a very well-deserved promotion. Uh, she's involved in a number of committees, but one of those is defining the standards for the use of next-generation sequencing in clinical applications. She's also involved in a major effort to develop and curate a clinical-grade universal variation database. As we look at all of the different things that we've become specialists in in the genomics field, it's just a small piece of that entire exome or that entire genome. And by pooling our knowledge together, we stand to gain and benefit more for ourselves and our patients than if we were trying to just harbor our own personal variation mutation databases within the walls of our own institution. So Heidi's been instrumental in, uh, in launching that program. She also happens to be an ultimate Frisbee player. And I believe uh, last year her team actually won the divisional championship. Is that correct? So if you fall asleep after lunch, she's got a pocket full of mini Frisbees. And she can, like a laser beam, just launch those things out there. So be careful. OK, so without further ado, Heidi, we welcome you here. Thank you for coming. And can't wait to hear your talk. Thanks, Matt. Always be careful what you share over drinks. You never know when it might come back to. Um, so I, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, I think some of the things I'll talk about uh, this, uh, this afternoon will ring true with some of the talks we heard um, already this morning, which was a great uh, series of talks. I do have a, just a couple of disclosures. I'm employed by Partners Healthcare. And we offer fee-for-service diagnostics and software. And I'm on several advisory boards, so no equity. So I thought I'd start out this um, talk with you know, a few cases to illustrate some of the principles that we think about. Um, and one, the first case is, is a dis disorder called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's one of the most common Mendelian disorders that exists. Um, and this is a typical family that we would see in the laboratory. Um, in this case, this family came to attention because of the child here at the bottom who died suddenly at age seven, and on autopsy was found to have a thickened heart, diagnostic for HCM. Uh, it wasn't until that diagnosis that the mother was then worked up by uh, ECHO and EKG and found to also have the disorder. 
So this is a, a typical family. This is an, a dominantly inherited disorder. Um, and we would want to do genetic testing. Why? But to predict the potential onset of disease in other family members. So this is one of the most um, you know, commonly tested for diseases. And the question I have for you is, which test do we do? We now have at our, you know, uh, at our hands the ability to do both targeted testing, and uh, this is just an example of targeting testing that, that's available, either a full cardiomyopathy panel or the subpanel for just those genes known to cause HCM. And the clinical sensitivity for that test today is about 40%. So 60% of cases we can't find the etiology, but 40% of them we can. Uh, on the other hand, we now have access to exome or genome sequencing to look at all of the genes for, although more money, not dramatically more money. So the question I have for all of you, and I'd like to see a raise of hands, how many would choose option one versus option two? So option one, raise your hand. Okay, what about option two? So I would say about equal. About half of you would start with the targeted test and about half with the exome or genome. So let's think about how do we make those decisions and, and what should we, what, what are the points of, of thinking about this? And I can tell you that today, the vast majority of cardiologists and geneticists that typically order this test, these tests, are actually starting with targeted sequencing. And in, in fact, for this family, that's exactly what was done. This mutation with, that was, was found to be pathogenic in the family, and family members were able to be tested to determine who's at risk. And in fact, their other child was positive, and despite a normal echo, is at risk for sudden cardiac death. So this is a lot of useful information for this family. Uh, but in this case, the choice was to do targeted testing, not exome or genome. So why, why would we do that? And when is it that we would shift to disease panels, um, from disease panels to exomes or genomes as the first line test? Well, I think, you know, there's several things that we need to think about and improve upon, more importantly, before we make that complete transition. Um, some of those are the need for improved, what we call variant calling accuracy. So on the right side is validation data from our next-gen targeted, um, disease-targeted panels. The technology does quite well for substitutions. We detected them all if you have sufficient coverage, in other words, the amount of data you can see. Indel's not as good. We all know that there's challenges in insertion and deletion to testing. We get about 97 percent. Um, the false positive rates. Not so bad for substitutions, but pretty bad for indels. About 15 percent of indels are just wrong. Um, and that's all of that is dependent on how much coverage you have. And in our targeted assays, we don't call anything below 20x coverage. Uh, and that's what gives us the reasonably high quality data that we get. Um, and when anything that falls below that, we fill in with Sanger. So any uncovered or the bioinformatic algorithm wasn't clear, we weren't sure if there was a rare, it all gets covered by Sanger sequencing to fill in every gap so we can ensure a full test. That, of course, is not done with exome or genome sequencing. You simply can't fill in every missing hole, and, we, and about 5 to 15 percent of the exome uh, is missing in exome sequencing. So the question is, what if it's missing a significant chunk of one of the very common genes involved in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Then your sensitivity could actually drop uh, significantly, potentially, if the very commonly involved regions are, in, in, are missing. Uh, likewise, when we think about a dominant disorder, particularly HCM, it's due to heterozygous, largely missense variants. And you have about 100,000 of those that are even unique to you out there in your genome. So the ability to look at any of them and say, oh, that's the one in a new gene that would be causing your HCM is extraordinarily challenging. For, so really in this scenario, exome or genome would be very difficult to, to argue would be better approach than disease-targeted testing today. In the future, I certainly hope that that evolves, but, but that's one example where I would actually do the disease-targeted testing today. Um, in addition, none of the platforms out there today that are offered clinically really encompass copy number detection in them. Um, you'd have to do array CGH or, or other cytogenomic approaches today to get that um, coverage. We have implemented this in our disease-targeted testing because we have some methods that are working for that, and we can detect in the left side a whole gene deletion, on the right side here a single exon deletion. But that only works in our targeted test. It doesn't work in our 
uh, genome and exome platforms. So th this is where we are today and, and where we struggle with making these decisions. Okay, case number two is a family with non-syndromic hearing loss. Um, there were five of nine children affected, all with the same shaped audiogram, um, no other complaints, and genetic testing was already done for those um, genes that were clinically available at the time, and that was negative. So in this case, we had already gone through the initial targeted testing, uh, and then we were moving on to genome be because we hadn't found an etiology. So, so we did that. We did whole genome sequencing on three different children in this family. Uh, there were about four million variants per child found, and by comparing the genomes across all three children, we could narrow that down to just 1.25 million. <laughs> uh, and I think that illustrates some of the challenges. Just, you know, even doing three children doesn't get you very far to narrow down the field. And we spent nine months trying to come up with an etiology for this family, uh, and we're not successful. And we put the case on hold, and then we ultimately decided to go back to our research roots and do linkage analysis, because this family was of reasonable size in this case. So we did linkage analysis, uh, and lo and behold, we actually got a LOD score over two uh, for a particular locus which if you zoom in there, you can see STRC, where that arrow is pointing. Now, this was a bit ironic to me because I had just co-authored a paper with Ian Krantz arguing for this being a very common cause of hearing loss. So, um, however, um, this, this figure here shows the coverage of the known hearing loss genes in exome sequencing. And while there are a number of genes that are well covered here, you can see down here there are a bunch of genes that are just poorly covered. One of them is stereocilin, and that gene is essentially not covered by exome sequencing, yet we now think is the second most common cause of childhood hearing loss. And this was missed, you know, in this case. Now we ended up, we launched our targeted next-gen test for hearing loss during the course of this uh, family, and, and once we saw that finding or that linkage, we ran it on our targeted test, and there was a huge signal for a copy number deletion in the stereocilin locus. Now, the reason this gene is not poorly, is poorly covered in exome is because it has a pseudogene right next to it uh, that's almost essentially identical. So they had lost both copies of the normal gene but retained the non-functional pseudogene. Uh, and, and the mapping errors that occur because of this issue make it very difficult to look at this region by exome sequencing. And that's why we missed it. We also missed it. We actually ran a SNP array for copy number assessment, which also missed this, despite the fact that it's homozygous, 100,000 bases deleted. Um, and that is because our automated filtering algorithm, which is the only way we can deal with these large amounts of data, had a frequency cutoff of 1%. 1, 1 this variant is found in 1.6% of the population who are carriers for it. So there are people in this room who carry this deletion. Um, and we couldn't put our brain into the filtering algorithm. So you make these assumptions. In this case, we made a 1% frequency assumption for the variant, causative variant being rare. Um, and that was wrong. And so we missed it two approaches. So, so this just illustrates the challenges that we deal with. Um, ultimately, we did find the cause of, of hearing loss in this family, uh, though I would argue that today I would still start with a targeted test for, for any child with hearing loss. Uh, this family was recently written up, you know, in the Boston Globe about the benefits and limits of DNA sequencing. Um, now here's case number three, and this I would argue is a case that illustrates why, what, how, how we can make use of exome and genome sequencing appropriately. So in this case is a family seen by Dr. Mike Murray with distal arthrogryposis type 5. Now this is a disorder that had been described in the literature. There's a number of different clinical features associated with this disorder, uh, and it was described as autosomal dominant in some cases or de novo occurrence in others. But there's no known genes. There's no test to order, no genetic test for this particular disorder. Um, however, the fact that it had been described as dominant and de novo, and we had a family with unaffected parents suggested to us that this was likely to be a de novo mutation. Um, and so we could sequence the trio, the parents and the child, and look just for differences. Um, and uh, Eric Green told you this morning that we, we expect across the genome about just 60 de novo variants. If you zoom in to the coding region, you expect to find about one per, per individual. 
So that actually incredibly narrows down your, your viewpoint in terms of trying to find what's causative. So we did this. We did whole, whole genome sequencing in all three of these individuals. We compared their genomes, and we came up with two de novo variants in the coding region. These were the two genes. Um, one we quickly ruled out. There was a lot of loss of function variants common in the population. We didn't think this was a critical functional gene. Uh, on the other hand, we had this gene piezo2, mechanical sensitive ion channel, but no disease ever associated to it. So this was this was a great candidate, right? It was a de novo variant, but but Eric told you this morning that on average everybody has 60 of these in your genome. So how can we prove that this is causative and not just one of these 60 that we all have and may or may not have an effect? And that that was where we st stood, you know, with a with a good candidate, but no real biological argument or evidence for how it's causing disease in this family. So what did we do? Well, we called up a colleague, um, Bertrand Cost, who was studying this gene functionally and said, could you put the mutation into your, your system and let's just at least see if it shows an effect. Um, and then the other part of this was really about serendipity, because it just so happened that there are so few researchers studying this protein that another group in Canada who happened to exome sequence another family with DA5 found a mutation in the same gene, happened to call the same guy within a week of each other, and now all of a sudden we had two cases. But I would argue serendipity is not the most you know, useful approach in general to pursue. We just happen to get lucky here. Um, and, and you really need that second family independent observation with the same phenotype to, to you know, feel that you have made a, a, a diagnosis in this case. So eventually, with those two pieces of data in hand, also gain a function, uh, functional assay, we're able to conclude that this was the gene causing DA5, and this was recently published. So this is an example where you know, I think largely the genome or exome approach would be the best approach to trying to find a diagnosis though this issue of serendipity still remains. And we're recently um, been collaborating with Ada Hamash and uh, Francois, whose last name I can never say, um, to help with an approach to reduce the need for serendipity. Uh, and the idea here is to use the PhenoDB system that uh, she and Francois have developed to collect phenotypes from Mendelian Sequencing Center programs um, and be able to upload gene candidates into that system to allow matchmaking so that everybody's loading up their cases where they haven't solved, but they've got interesting candidates. And that would allow us to be able to play matchmaker through this system. And Joel Creer and our group is helping with some of the algorithms to enable appropriate matchmaking. So this is, this is still a work in progress, but it's something that we'd like to develop to enable all these unsolved cases. And, and Howard spoke about some of these this morning um, to eventually be solved more quickly. Okay. So that's, that's part of the question is, you know, when do we do what test? But there's, there's a bigger challenge that we deal with all the time, and the biggest bottleneck in sequencing is actually interpreting each of the variants that we find. Whether they're in genome or exome or they're in targeted tests, um, we spend lots of time interpreting variants and classifying them into these sort of graded categories from benign, likely benign, uncertain, likely pathogenic, pathogenic, unfortunately too many of them end up in the middle. And even when they're in the middle, we still spend a lot of time. We time our fellows. How long does it take you to assess everything you can find on a variant? Uh, and that takes time. And that's just the first step in drafting the case and correlating it with the clinical findings. So we've done this you know, for 10 years, but it's extraordinarily labor intensive. And even when you have lots of experience, in this case, data from 3,000 HCM cases, still two thirds of them, we never saw the variant again. It's essentially unique to the family. So developing experience doesn't necessarily get you to understand all of these variants when you're doing them in an isolated testing environment. Uh, hearing loss with recessive disorders worse. 81% of the mutations that we find, we never see again. So, so this is a challenge for all of us in interpreting this, this data. You can't just wait for somebody to publish a paper on your variant. It may never come out. Likewise, in the MedSeq study led by Robert Green, we've been analyzing genomes to find incidental findings. Uh, and I won't talk about the whole pipeline, but on the left side, we filter all these genomes by any published pathogenic variant, and we find about 20 to 40 per case. Uh, and then we go into the, those variants and we review the evidence for their pathogenicity claim. And this is the data from that. About 3% of them turn out to have enough evidence for pathogenicity. Huge bucket of them, there's not enough evidence to make any claim. 
And then for a, almost half of them, there's enough evidence to say they're definitely not disease associated. Um, so this, this is a huge problem in the literature, uh, in our community, is, is false claims uh, in terms of the evidence for disease causation. Uh, we need a much more stringent approach to be able to claim that these variants are pathogenic. And let me give you an example of where this is really problematic. So I, uh, we had asked Sherry Bale, director of GeneDx, to give a talk on the importance of data sharing. She stood up uh, at our conference and talked about a case that they had reported a, a variant as pathogenic based on a publication from a very reputable you know, lab uh, that studied this disease. They referenced the paper, and then the patient decided to take it upon themselves to contact the author to find out if there was more information learned about this variant that they had been diagnosed as new, with Noonan syndrome as a result of. So they contacted the, the author, and he said, oh, well, since then, I've now studied Ashkenazi Jewish controls. We find this variant commonly. We don't think it's pathogenic. We think it's benign. Well, that was interesting for me, because I was sitting in the audience. We test this disorder. And I quickly looked into our database while Sherry's giving this talk, and I found a case that we had tested. Now, unlike this story, where it was an uh, individual with a diagnosis of Noonan, this was a fetus with an ultrasound finding of increased nuchal translucency, just a slightly enlarged space in the back of their neck. Uh, and we reported the same variant, classified it as likely pathogenic based on this publication. We were unaware of the data that was in hand at that time, and this fetus was terminated. So this is a big deal, and this, this still haunts me, this whole case. So if this data had been shared, and there was a mechanism to share the data, and I don't totally fault the author, because there really has not been a good mechanism for a researcher to just get this little piece of data, which is not sufficient for a publication, out into the public domain easily. So I think this, this really emphasizes a critical need for us to share knowledge and data easily and create the mechanisms to do that. So I'm very pleased to say that uh, just a week ago, we were awarded a grant, U41 Genomic Resource Grant that Matt's also involved in, um, really to standardize the way that we annotate and interpret variants, to share that data through centralized databases, to develop expert-based consensus approaches to curating that data, uh, and to facilitate stakeholder involvement through our International Collaboration for Clinical Genomics. Uh, organization. Uh, th that's not the only grant that's been funded, and, and Eric Green mentioned this project this morning, uh, now named the ClinGen Project for the Clinical Genome Resource Program. And in addition to our grant, we're working with two other um, groups that have been funded through NHGRI's U01 mechanism. They are led by Carlos Bustamante and Sharon Plon, Jonathan Berg, Jim Evans, David Ledbetter, and Mike Watson, um, and then also working with NCBI on their ClinVar database. And, and that is actually the database that we're working with. Donna McGlott has spearheaded this project at NCBI. Uh, and this new database was launched in April as a mechanism to share clinical annotations on variants. So not just put variants in dbSNP, but actually share what we all think about these variants. To date, there's um, over 49,000 variants that have been deposited in the database. So we have, um, we're second on that list. We've submitted all of our clinical annotations that we've developed over the last 10 years into this um, database, uh, and other laboratories are following suit. Uh, and in fact, this is just a list of the laboratories through the grant process that agreed to share data. And with, with only rare exception, almost every laboratory uh, in the clinical space has, has agreed to do this. Um, we've, there's a lot of systems that have been built or will be built as part of this project, and I don't have time to get into all the complexity, but there'll be efforts to enable lots of data sharing at different levels um, across many, many groups, uh, as well as interfaces for the public to get access to this data, um, to be able to learn and, and, and build upon that knowledge. And I will stop there, acknowledge a number of the people and the uh, different projects that I spoke about. Thank you, and we'll take questions at the end. Well, that's a great talk. Thank you very, very much. Um, for those of you uh, standing in the aisle way over there, uh, there are seats available still in the center of the hall here. So I don't know if it's best to, for folks to scooch over or for people just to say excuse me and work their way in. But there's still quite a few seats here if, you, if you're really intent on finding a, a cushy, comfortable seat. 
Okay, so our next speaker, uh, for those of you uh, from the Mayo Clinic here, really needs no introduction. It's Dr. Franklin Cockerell, our own CEO and director for Mayo Medical Laboratories. Um, it's an honor to have him come in here on short notice. He's kind of pinch hitting here, but I've heard him give these talks before and he's very well versed within this area of conversation, lab developed tests, regulatory requirements. Mayo plays a very active role in these spaces. We're often seen as one of the leaders for lab quality systems, lab quality issues, and Dr. Cockrell, I know, is very involved on our behalf to help tackle these issues. Um, so, Frank, thank you very much for agreeing on short notice to come give us this talk. Can't wait to hear it. Sure. Thanks. Oh, I forgot to mention, too, uh, Frank and I have worked together a lot on next-gen sequencing, and through a lot of those efforts, I've, I've learned that Frank is a Lady Gaga fan. Yes, I am. <laughs> yes, I am. And uh, because this is kind of a boring subject, I know you only gave me 20 minutes, but I was going to bring my Miley Cyrus and oh, uh, <laughs> slides uh, and Justin Bieber slides, but it's going to be pretty, pretty dull. And this is about regulatory and uh, what we call laboratory developed tests for those of you who are not familiar. So what we're talking about, you saw a lot of great talks about next-gen sequencing and the promise of uh, whole genome sequencing exome sequencing. Heidi gave us a reality check to, to some extent. And I'm going to present what we thought maybe Liz Mansfield would present from FDA, although I am not Liz Mansfield. I do not represent the FDA. Now, my uh, assistant said to me about a week ago, you have to substitute for Jane Mansfield. She can't make it. <laughs> All the old people are laughing, none of the young ones. So uh, you're going to have to Google that very quickly, young folks, to figure out who that is. Um, so here's the outline very briefly. I will define laboratory-developed tests, LDTs. Now, we're going to focus on that because all of this new activity in genomic, exomic, uh, gene panel sequencing, microarrays is pretty much all LDTs. In other words, there aren't companies that have gone through uh, FDA approval processes to present a, something you can purchase. We'll talk about the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Act requirements, which we've had for several decades, FDA requirements that we have as testers, New York State requirements. This is getting pretty long, isn't it? Yeah, we, have, we are the most heavily regulated industry, uh, the laboratory, or let's say specialty in medicine. So there are three that we're going to focus on that we're subject to. And then I'll briefly uh, uh, whine about the redundancies among these. And then, importantly, uh, show you what the consequences could be if you're not in compliance. Now, I have the privilege of heading the academic mission. So we have almost 180 clones like this, 180 <laughs> academicians. So I have that part of it. And then on the other side, I have the for-profit business. We're one of the largest reference labs in the United States and currently one of the largest reference labs in collaboration with another outfit in China. So we do a lot of very specialized testing, and of course we're held in high regard, but at the same time high scrutiny by regulatory agencies to make sure that we do this right. And regarding that, I'll have to disclose that I do work as a special government employee for the FDA and have for I think about 12 or 14 years. Uh, so I know the group there very well. I also am an SBE for a CDC, and CDC's had some input into NextGen, but my comments do not represent those of the FDA. So what is a laboratory-developed test? The American Society for Clinical Pathology has it here. Uh, this is what we pretty much use and the FDA use. Diagnostic tests that are developed and validated and used for in-house, so that's within a laboratory setting. Uh, for uh, diagnostic services. The tests are formulated from reagents that are created in-house or purchased from outside. So these are not FDA uh, cleared or approved. And according to the FDA, these are medical devices. So because we're a medical device, we're held at the uh, requirements that the FDA presents. And we'll get that in that little bit. And just as I said earlier, the reason we're focusing on LDTs is that next gen sequencing on many genetic tests fit into that category. So we don't want to be a medical device, and we've been challenging the authorities um, in Gaithersburg and inside the Beltway in Washington, D.C. We don't want to be called a medical device like a pacemaker, but we are. 
And because of that, we have to follow the uh, requirements of the FDA for medical devices. And some of these slides actually came from um, uh, Katie Serrano, who works at the FDA, so thanks to her for loaning those. Now, FDA, uh, laboratory testers who do laboratory-developed tests, and if you do FDA-cleared tests, have uh, over us um, or have the responsibility, uh, the requirements to fulfill um, the statutes that relate to uh, medical devices, including laboratory tests. And actually, these were established in 1976. The important thing at the bottom of this slide is that the FDA was not actively enforcing these requirements until recently. And the reason for that, and I won't get into all the specifics here, but um, there were the direct-to-consumer tests that were occurring and pretty much outside CLIA labs. And CLIA is the organization that we have to supply certification to of our specialists, so that has to be documented. And then through other agencies, we'll um, make sure that what we're doing, our processes are acceptable in the laboratory through like the College of American Pathology. But you gotta remember, and I hear this all the time, we have a CLIA approved test. CLIA does not approve tests. They oversee the environment where the testing is done and they're pretty tight about that with the credentialing and the processes, but we don't send a test to CLIA for approval. And I wanna mention too that related to CLIA, when you hear that CLIA labs, well, uh, this uh, group ha is a CLIA certified lab and they're doing CLIA, CLIA approved tests. You can go on the web and pay a few hundred dollars and get a CLIA number. And you can be in business for a period of time until you get caught. But uh, basically, CLIA approval, it shouldn't be, shouldn't be used. So when the direct-to-consumer genetic testing was occurring um, a few years ago, uh, the FDA, now we're swinging back to the FDA, got concerned about the complexity of the testing that was now occurring. It's not a simple potassium uh, or a sodium or even a specific SNP or mutation that you're looking at. Now it's multiple data points. And this becomes very complex as far as validity and utility. And I, if you remember anything from what I say uh, today, a test has to be useful and it has to be of value and it has to be safe. But the first two things kind of add into the safety. So useful, so useful in a population that you're applying it to and it has to be valid. It has to be analytical validation, it has to be there in the clinical validation. And that's what we have to go through the exercises in the lab to make sure that we fulfill all of those requirements. So what I thought best today so we can uh, make this short, again, it's a bit of a mundane uh, topic, but to put the two of these together, and I edited this a little bit, and this came from Courtney Harper from the FDA. She put this together several years ago in a public meeting to compare CLIA, which is part of CMS, and FDA. So what are their requirements? Well, unfortunately, they're not the same. So you can see what we struggle with in the laboratory, trying to make sure that we fulfill both sides of this, these requirements, and we haven't gotten to New York State yet. But what's important to see here is that, first of all, there's registration. Now, with FDA, it's public. With CMS, it's private. Analytical validation, make sure your agents work in the right way and the chemistry works, um, and you have to, there's a validation process for that that we'll get to in just a little bit. Um, so both CMS and FDA have requirements for that. The difference is clinical validation is required by FDA, but not CMS. So the clinic, remember I said it has to be a useful test and valid, valid validity is both analytical and clinical, and we'll get into an example of that in just a little bit. Quality systems have to be present, and you can see the requirements with CMS and FDA that don't completely uh, overlap. Design controls, so as we uh, initiate tests, the concept of the test, how we're going to do the validation, we have to document all that. Here's what we're gonna do. Um, so you list what you're gonna do, do what you say, and document it. That's what the FDA says all the time. And so it's a process of validation that occurs 
uh, and it's, this goes under the term, general term of design controls. Adverse re event reporting, not required by CMS, but uh, FDA, so that's the post testing. And Heidi had a great example of that, where you have an initial finding and reported that um, a variant is significant, and then uh, intervention occurs, and then subsequent to that, you find out that that, uh, that SNP or that association was invalid. It was a false positive, I guess I would say. And then you have to report. Uh, if you've sent out reports to anybody else about that, you have to then let them know that uh, you are changing uh, the interpretation of all those reports in the past, and there are ways to do that, and that's the FDA. And that's part of recalls, too. So um, you can see all the nuances here. Now, briefly uh, talk about CLIA requirements for analytical validation, and they're all listed here. And if I had time, I could bore you with all the specifics of what you have to do, but I want to emphasize that this is not trivial, and it takes quite a while to do this. And we have very excited clinicians, and when we survey across the planet for new targets for all our tests that we develop, in a week they say, where's that, new where's that next gen sequencing test? Why would it take you so long to that? So we try to go through in a diplomatic way, this is what we have to do. There's a lot of pieces to this for validation and then potential approval. Accuracy, how close are you to the truth? And is the truth the truth, the gold standard, of course, precision? How many times serially can you get close to that result? And then there's a reportable range, a reference range, analytic specificity, and sensitivity. So all of these things have to be determined and have to be on the label that you show to your clinician if he or she is interested in how, how useful that test is in the clinical setting. So again, CLIA does not mandate that we determine this clinical sensitivity and specificity of the test. It's the analytical. FDA is the clinical. Um, but CAP, College of American Pathology, has deemed status with CLIA, so they come in to inspect for CLIA, and on their checklist, the molecular checklist in the last couple of years, we're seeing clinical validation requirements. For the, it's on the checklist, which is saying, well, CMS is kind of interested in, 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 in maybe uh, seeing what's going on out there. Um, many of you are familiar with this, a rather simple two-by-two two that we use. We have the disease, so that's the annotation. That's, we know this is a patient with whatever is going on. Um, so we have the phenotype, and we compare the test in this entrance, in this example, a genotype to the disease, and then we see what our sensitivity and specificity is. Now, remember, and I'm not speaking for the FDA, but if you say the, the, uh, your test will be have X sensitivity and X specificity as long as you validate that. It's okay to have that test. And a, te and a, and a uh, test that has, low, uh, that has very high sensitivity, uh, sorry, uh, lower sensitivity, maybe in the 80% range, but high specificity might have value in populations like STD testing where you get to see them once, you do the test, you treat them, versus they have to come back for the result if it's a higher sensitivity, but the test takes longer. And this is an example of a test, bladder cancer, compared to cytology, and you can see here this is 60% sensitive and 95% specific. Again, um, you don't have to hit 100% sensitivity and specificity. In some diseases, it's more crucial or critical than others, but this is what would be on your label, and you have to have the data to support that. Now, it could be that the FDA or an approval group said we would say we don't like a sensitivity at 60 percent, but uh, you certainly, if, this, if there's an unmet medical need and there's no other test that will do this, then that's something that would be useful for the clinician. Now, we're used to doing testing. I've been in R&D for many, many years and used to doing it with few targets and um, so it's a pretty easy kind of evaluation that we don't have a lot of variability. When you look at the genome or genes, you can have a lot of EUS, there's a lot of variability. And the more targets that you have, which is all your base pairs in the millions, the chances of having a miss, a false positive or negative are going to, are going to be, uh, could be significant. 
So what's happened, FDA actually, and the meetings I've attended there, has been very interested in getting societies, and that's why it's great to see that data collection that you have with the variants, because that's what we need, uh, real-time, um, uh, let's say, VUS uh, determination or uh, association. Already the American College of Medical Genetics, CLSI, CDC, and even others have gotten together to talk about what would be proper validation for some of these uh, approaches. Now, New York State. We're gonna pretty much finish with that. So here we are in Rochester, Minnesota, but we do with Mayo Medical Laboratories a lot of uh, work in New York State. And New York State approves our tests. And New York State includes both analytical and clinical validation. So it's a pretty rigorous approval process. And so um, this gentleman knows Matt, that Dr. Cockrell, who may at any time end up in an orange jumpsuit because we have 140 CLIA labs in seven states, uh, that if we aren't in um, compliance with all of these agencies, um, uh, I could lose my job. And, and we've been told all of our laboratories could be shut down. So we have to be very cognizant of what the requirements are. And we've had an enormous amount of activity here with next-gen sequencing, clinical testing, and doing it right. And Matt knows that, and his team has done an excellent job in getting all the requirements together to make sure these tests are useful, valid, and safe. So it's a little bit of a sales pitch here. But he, at time, has been frustrated saying, Frank, you require New York State approval before we can get any tests out. And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And how many times you'd ask me that? But uh, 20 times. Um, but we have conditional approval, probably the first uh, pr approval at New York State for such testing, which is a level of quality that we wanted to strive for. So it's taken us a while. We have gene panels, uh, quite a few coming down, potentially exome in the future and whole genome. But uh, we want to make sure that we're in compliance with New York State. So you can see here uh, registration. We heard that before. It's certificate of qualification. So CMS and New York State require that all of our testers be qualified. And that includes that uh, Dr. Ferber has uh, proper credentials. And uh, then inspections occur just like CMS every couple of years. And we do internal inspections as well. And um, both analytical and clinical validation. So I hope you've learned today. I'm just going to repeat this one more time. Utility, value, safety. The two major, and Tad's gone, yeah. Um, analytical validation we need to do and clinical validation. So there are two, two parts to the validation process. Um, and they approve tests for us. And right now, that's the only agency besides FDA that approves IVDs. But a guidance may be coming out that will also be approval for the LDTs. So there's redundancy. And I'm not going to get into this in any great depth. But Frank spends time uh, out east in the Washington area trying to convince our legislators and our regulators that please make it one. And let's not have all these things that we have to do. And you can see where these things overlap. Now, what are the consequences of noncompliance? Well, the, cons the consequence that we always think of, and it's not listed here, this is really to regulatory, but is the patient. So you always have to think of that patient. And uh, Matt has convinced our teams here that you need to, for positive results with NextGen, at least at this time, validate those with um, conventional um, Sanger sequencing. I mean, these are the things that we come up with with all the wonderful work that his team has done. But um, what is the consequence? You can lose your CLIA license. Well, if you lose your CLIA license, and then we've been told here, all of your 140 labs will shut down in seven states because you're under one tax ID. So all will be shut down. Um, you can lose the New York State Department of Health COQ license with similar consequences, except that we could not do testing for New York State patients. So if you live in New York State, we wouldn't be able to do your tests if we lost that license. I can lose my job. Probably not you, because I'm on the license. Um, and I cannot direct a lab for two years or something like that. Um, importantly, our, uh, up front, you may be denied reimbursement. But if you are charging a government-funded patient, it's fraud. 
And fraud can be severe um, because if you don't have a validated test and you charge, God forbid, a Medicare or Medicaid patient, that's fraud. So it gets you into that category, which is a whole nother, um, no whole nother issue. And those of you who read G2 can read about Mayo in there today, and it talks about Mayo being accused by a whistleblower of doing such a thing, and we were, um, uh, the court said there's no evidence to support this. So um, you gotta be very careful with the billing if you have unvalidated testing. Um, so, um, some of our partners uh, that do testing and do, uh, in, uh, for the most part, very, very good testing. We work together with Quest and LabCorp. have had some major settlements. Quest, $302 million for a single test, a parathyroid test that on label said it would perform X and was not validated to support that. So the label said one thing, the utility was advertised as such but the validation, the clinical validation was not there. So these can be, the, the penalties can be uh, severe. And then there was a test over sure a few years ago that we all learned about together along with LabCorp and that again is validation when you're working with another institution. In this case it was Yale had done some of the work and then it passed on to LabCorp and then that becomes a commercial vended sort of test and you're subject to what the IVD companies would be the same. So that test had been removed. Again, the consequences could be severe. It was more expression, so it was more um, phenotype, but uh, targets that were related to propose, uh, supposed to um, increase risk of ovarian cancer and women were having hysterectomies and ovarectomies and uh, that uh, was not a, val a validated test for that. So uh, that's it, and um, thanks for listening to me. I knew it'd be good. And Frank, I just want to say, if you do end up in an orange jumpsuit, I'll definitely stop by with care packages. Okay, our final speaker uh, for today's session is Carl Gunter. Carl and I actually met each other through the collaboration with Mayo and the University of Illinois. So we've had spent some time over uh, the television and through video conferencing, but also back and forth between the two different institutions. It's been a great collaborative project, not just uh, for our specific areas of interest, but for things like microbiome and other things that the two institutions are doing together. Carl himself uh, is a computer scientist who works in the computer security, especially security inform informatics, and namely the application of security concepts and technologies in a specific application domains. In recent years, he's been working primarily on security for the electric power grid and healthcare. So I'm sure we're gonna learn a little bit more about that in today's talk. His work on healthcare includes serving as the director of the HHS Strategic Health IT Advanced Research Projects on Security, other no, otherwise known as SHARPS, and the Health Information Technology Center, HITC, at the University of Illinois. He's recently started to work on security and privacy for genomic data as part of a new NSF-sponsored project called Trustworthy Health and Wells Wellness, THAW, great acronym. Today he's going to talk about the first steps on that project for ways to communicate genomic data to individuals as part of a genomic personal health records program. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Now, Carl, I may be making a major overstatement here, but are you a car guy? I, I, maybe. I'm yeah. not sure. <laughs> are you, I, I, on your um, LinkedIn page, do you have a picture of you there with, it looks like a Porsche in the background. Is that? Okay, I, I I'm, I'm glad. There's another Carl Gunter out there. <laughs> All right, I was going to ask what your favorite car is. But. All right, thank you, Carl. <laughs> sure. Uh, it's so nice to get invited here to uh, give a talk uh, in a context with uh, so many physicians. We. I often uh, go to meetings where we're mostly computer scientists and uh, there are a few physicians in the audience and the computer scientists tend to be more liberal types than the physicians. So we talk about things and the physicians are a little more of a conservative bent 
And so maybe this will reflect that too. I, I, I won't be talking much about going to jail, but we'll have some pretty, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, interesting novel ways of viewing some of these things, I hope, that uh, will spark some interesting discussion. Okay, so for, let me first uh, start with a few basics here. So health information exchange. So uh, it's uh, urged to be used as a verb by the Office of the National Coordinator, some sort of process of sharing health records between typically institutions. So pa uh, patients can get their records from their physician at one institution and take them to a physician at another institution. Uh, it used to be we did this with fax, but fax doesn't work very well for digital things. And if we want to go to digital things, we need to be able to do it with digital networks. Uh, and so, uh, you know, to do that, we need an infrastructure to do that. So when it's used as a noun, health information exchange usually refers to some concept of an infrastructure, say, for the authentication or for the networking and so on to do that. Now, uh, a variant, you can think of this as kind of a special instance of health information exchange is when you want to share the exchange, information with the patient. So uh, lab results sometimes arrive for me in the mail. Uh, I open up a letter and there's a lab result described on a piece of paper. If you want to do it digitally, uh, then you need something else uh, besides this. So here's the Markle Foundation's official definition, which I'll read. It's an electronic application through which individuals can access, manage, and share their health information and that of others for whom they are authorized. Okay, and so uh, in particular, uh, you can think of personal health records as potentially containing a mechanism uh, for health information exchange. Uh, I moved from Philadelphia to Urbana, Illinois, and went to my physicians in Philadelphia and said, give me my health records and uh, so I could take them with me to Illinois. I went to my dentist and I said, give me my health records. They gave me one you know, uh, r uh, photograph and I said, you know, uh, is that it? That's all there is? But I took it by hand to the new dentist, and so the uh, you know, result is that I you know, did health information exchange for them. And uh, so uh, here you could imagine that same process where you know, the patient's given the data, they see a new physician, they share the data with the physician. Okay, so now the main purpose of the talk here was I wanted to start speculating on what personal health records will look like when they start to include genomic data. Okay, so uh, let's ask first, well, what's different about genomic data? Is there anything different about it? I mean, is it just like anything else? I send a letter with the genomic data or whatever it is I used to do, I just do it for genomic data. Well, there are a few things. First, it's relatively large and complex, can be. Uh, it's variably accurate uh, for both the reading and the interpretation. Uh, it has long-lasting value, so, you know, compared to many lab tests, you know, it's got a long period over which it has validity, of the, so a lifetime, in fact. Uh, it has a rapidly evolving understanding of the relationship to phenotype and a strong interest for research because we're at the threshold uh, of, a, of an era in which, the, you know, this information is going to become uh, known to us that's been, you know, not known for a long time. So it's also got poorly understood privacy implications, like an individual's desire not to know something. And so we, we don't encounter that very often in, in computer science. It's an odd idea that you would have access to something, but you don't want to know it, or you know, would you be wanting to ask not to have access to things? Uh, a risk of personal identification. The uh, genome is in some ways intrinsically identifying, so it's a little different from you know, other tests where you can take off the name and you've done some step towards de-identifying the data. Uh, rapidly declining costs, so it's going to become much more common, uh, and many potential benefits, but uh, mixed acceptance, uh, even among physicians, has uh, been my experience. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting here uh, to me is this thing I'm calling here the genomic data chasm, and so we, we see it, uh, you know, in discussions at the meeting here. Uh, on the clinical side, you have tests for specialists for genetic markers, and we already even had a little bit of discussion of exactly specific examples of dealing with this question, versus whole genome sequences, uh, for example, uh, for uh, PCPs who want to identify highly likelihood concerns over a broad spectrum, for researchers who are very interested, uh, and also it's probably going to start to make uh, economic sense that you collect the whole genome, and then when you need to do a genetic test, you do it in silica by looking up the proper thing inside the genome rather than rerunning some sort of in vitro test. On the other hand, there's the direct-to-consumer market. 
and it, it has some advantages. And so for even the sites where you go on the web to the various organizations and you look at what they have to say, even the ones that are opposed to it will concede certain advantages. So it enables some broad access at potentially low cost for diverse reasons uh, so that all kinds of things can be tested. Um, you see paternity testing and genealogy studies. Uh, so now there's a tab on Ancestry.com where you can go there and get DNA to include in your you know, uh, genealogy work. Uh, it has controversial issues, of course, with the um, quality uh, of the results uh, and uh, particularly their interpretation. But uh, I think a thing that's important here for me is um, following uh, my experience with the computer industry there's a kind of disruptive influence. When you have things that are cheap and common, they tend to start to have an influence on the things that are expensive and rare. And so that you know, the, the cheap things you know, have advantages and eventually the quality may improve and you start to see a, a disruptive thing where the chasm here starts to close. Okay. Now, here's a, a little bit of an example. This is coming from uh, this uh, very same meeting last year. Uh, it's a joint project between the University of Illinois and, and Mayo. Um, and uh, uh, you can see here some of the folks involved, including Matt here. And um, it's a, 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 you know, a, an effort to improve using you know, readability criteria for people, uh, the uh, reporting uh, of uh, genomic data uh, so on the left, what you see is a, a kind of report that highlights the important things that the doctor needs to know. And, and on the right is a, a drill down uh, into things that look more like something a geneticist uh, would read. And so I won't go into the details here. We have experts on, on this topic. And I got a lot of discussion, I'm told, last year whether this was the right way to go. Uh, but the point is that uh, it, you know, there's some mechanism to interface with the genomic data that makes it tractable. I mean, otherwise, it, it's not going to be usable. Okay, now, when you contrast, though, you ask, should we give this to the patient? I mean, you're supposed to share their lab tests, uh, but probably not. I mean, it's going to be pretty hard for them to handle, and it's going to cause, well, they, they probably won't understand it. And so the question is, what would you give them? And, and so I, I suppose there's some experience with this, but they're getting a lot of experience with it in the um, DTC space, of course. And so here's an example uh, for uh, 23andMe uh, of a uh, patient record. So this one is not a, a focus test, but a list of the things you should be worried about. Okay? And so these are the ones for which the GWAS tests have some s shown some enhanced likelihood of your getting that condition. So uh, for example, you can see here that prostate cancer is a 29.3% chance versus 17.8% chance. Um, and, and so on. And they have ones where you have an increased resistance that can raise your spirits after reading something like this. Okay? And so um, the uh, um, question is, well, okay, uh, you know, I've got an increased chance of prostate cancer, but how do you know that? And so if you click on prostate cancer, it drills down. And what you see here is, um, first of all, you know, the sort of raw statistics from the GWAS test from which this was derived. And you see down here a little explanation uh, followed by some references, and these are picked by like a panel of Stanford geneticists that you know recommend which ones to use, and and so this will give some more detailed understanding. You can see that this has some value for patient engagement at the very least, that you can start learning more about what these things mean in a form that's you know directed to you, but without losing your moorings in the scientific foundation. On the other hand, some of the you know. Uh, uh, the folks here are pretty more, you know, more adventurous. Uh, so, for example, here I could go order tests for my wife and I and find out if we're actually genetically compatible. <laughs> and uh, so, um, you know, one wonders, like, what are the scientific papers that are supporting this? I didn't see any on the website. Um, so uh, the, um, uh, the result is that the chasm's pretty real, right? So there's a big difference between this and the kind of stuff we were hearing before, right? There's a kind of big gap. Okay, so... All right, but what is it that you usually put in a PHR anyway? I mean, maybe it wouldn't be genomic stuff. Like, you know, maybe that's not appropriate. Well, here's um, a meta-study that took uh, some dozens of papers and said, like, surveying all of the stuff that we've seen on PHRs coming out recently, 
what would you say, you know, who's supposed to put in what? Okay, and so this is a table showing who's supposed to put in what. And so I see here, you know, that, for example, you have family history in there, and you have laboratory tests, and we've already heard that, you know, genome sequencing can be viewed as a uh, kind of clinical proxy for the family history data. And, and so it seems logical that there would be, you know, some need to communicate the uh, information to patients through their PHR. Uh, and so, you know, one asks, how is this going to be done? Now, I'm not primarily an HCI kind of person, so I'm not thinking primarily here for myself today uh, about, like, how you would make it look on the screen. Uh, the thing that is more interesting to me, I, I like to think of things as um, when there's something you would like to do, but there's, say, some security and privacy or systems barrier to that, or it seems risky because of our current state of the art, what would you have to develop in order to go a step beyond that and to get to the point that you could do what you really wanted to do with the confidence uh, that you need? Okay, so that's kind of my interest here. So the, the theme I wanted to put forward is there's going to be eventually, I, I think this is inevitable, but some of you may think it's already been done, some may think it'll never happen, I'm not sure, it'd be interesting to hear your opinions. Uh, but sharing health information through HIE and PHR, which is genomic data, clinical genomic tests and interpretation, and also possibly DTT set tests and interpretations or interpretations. And so, you know, can they cohabit in a single uh, resource for, uh, for people so that uh, they can, uh, can do uh, their genomic explorations, you know, with tools that help them get what they want out of that? And so there are many challenges there, but there are also some interesting opportunities. And uh, let's, let's uh, look at a kind of functional vision of this. So you might imagine that there's the patient and they see the genomic data. And I'll get, you know, of course, they're not going to see the raw genomic data. And so the question is, see what uh, is, is the uh, key question. There's also the lab that needs to communicate the data. Uh, the lab will need to make sure if it's uploaded in this way that uh, the results are put in accurately and that there's an adequate degree of integrity to assure that the data comes from the lab you think it comes from and so on. Then you'll have parties like the medical geneticists who will work through this and they may or may not be looking at the same thing the patient is looking at. Uh, probably the patient needs a different view of the data from what the geneticist does. And then people like a genealogist. So if you're going to do these sequencings, they have value for reasons other than, uh, you know, disease um, uh, detection. Okay, so What's the current architecture in hospitals? Okay, so I'll call it a mainframe with terminals. And so what I want to do here is speculate on how this might be done uh, in a way that is somewhat edgy. That is, instead of, you know, thinking of it as residing in the hospital mainframe or staying at the lab or something, so what would be the alternatives? And so a typical thing is that you have down in the basement a big computer and on the wards terminals that allow you to access the big computer. And that model has seen some variations over time, like, you know, remote access on the internet. Uh, I had uh, experience, I was a uh, data clerk for the Billings Hospital, when, uh, that's the old University of Chicago hospital name. And I was that guy that's standing there with the little piece of paper coming out, and I would take that paper and put it in piles and set it aside for them. And, and so, so that the, and then up on the wards they had the computers that put all the data into that, that machine. And so that, that model has persisted um, pretty much, um, and it's now being challenged a bit because we're moving to new models in computer science. I mean, the computer technology has moved very rapidly in a lot of areas, and so this model might not be the model that we would have in the future, although probably a large part of it will persist for a long time given the investment in it. Okay, but what's the alternative? So, so here's another uh, vision of this sort of thing. So you see these two types of pressure. One is the doctors want the data to be on their mobiles. Um, the patients want to use their mobiles to collect data and report it to the doctor. The uh, hospital is uh, told that it can have tremendous savings by outsourcing the data to third parties that are good at managing data and can do even things like HIPAA compliance. And so you get this um, idea of uh, the, the cloud, which consists not of a mainframe computer, but of an amorphous set of computers in various locations that can shrink or grow according to the requirements that you need for them. 
So for example, if you suddenly need to have twice as much data as you did the day before, then the resources can be found to do that within a day you know, on, these, on these kinds of machines. So you don't have heavy duty provisioning, for example. And they can also deal, deal with uh, terminals that are everywhere and including small devices. Okay, and so you think, well, you know, could this be a model for how we share data uh, with patients through this kind of uh, architecture? And I just wanted to go through some of the pros and cons of this. So first, kind of how would it work? Okay, and so here's the typical kind of way you do this. And so you can ask, could this work with genomic data? And let me just speculate on it. A common model is that you have heavyweight applications that are in the cloud that do really heavy duty computations or deal with large amounts of data. Then you have representatives or pieces of those applications that run on the mobiles or other accessing uh, systems that allow you to do certain things locally. And so for example, you would imagine that the way this might be is that you have genomic data in a uh, cloud system uh, that there would be applications that can manage that data, but multiple types of applications that reflect different needs for the data. So for example, the app that's used for the genealogist would be quite different from the app that the geneticists use. Uh, also, you might have multiple types of data. So there might be the um, uh, data that you get from the Mayo Clinic uh, would be, you know, one type of data. And then there would be another type of data that you get, you know, from uh, gene partners, and those can both, they're just data for the system, and the computer science technology is now well capable of keeping them apart so that the uh, integrity levels can be kept, kept track of so you don't mix the two up. Okay, so, so that's the kind of, you know, framework that a lot of things are going into these days, and I think that there could be a considerable benefit to viewing some of this for genomic data in this light. Okay, so let's go a little bit on the benefits. So the genomic data would be available to individuals and all their providers for a lifetime. So you think of the thing, if I give it to the patient and the patient gives it to whoever needs it, then you know, they can always get that data to the physician that they have that needs to know that data. Apps will provide a dynamic collection of ways to use the genomic data because one of the things I'm thinking of this is that the app provides an abstraction of the data. So for example, if you're a, spe a specialist, you can have an app that looks only at the piece of the genome that's appropriate to what you're doing, and you don't have to take responsibility for viewing all the rest of it or claiming that you've viewed all the rest of it. Uh, it supports impending U.S. law on PHRs. In other words, you're going to have to share lab results with patients, and so this would be perhaps a way that you could start thinking about how to do that. Uh, it can support research, and so one of the kinds of things you see in the DTC area is trying to harness these communities as, you know, sources of people to step up and say, hey, I have a variant or the like, and so, you know, please include me for something. So it could be a recruitment tool for the willing, okay? And it also hosts other kinds of more dynamic information, various omics data, because the infrastructure required to do the genomic data uh, would be the right kind of infrastructure to take these other heavyweight kinds of data. You can imagine apps, so here's where you can, you know, think, wait, what would you imagine the way the apps would be? So you can make customized reports. So one of the kinds of things you see is people using apps to give different display modes. And so you could imagine the same data being displayed in two different ways, depending on whether it's a geneticist or a patient. Um, and uh, it can provide personalized subscriptions to research data, for example, to update you when things, when things are learned. It can encourage participation in research. Um, in particular, uh, you could also put phenotype data in there, so uh, people could take the output of their Fitbits and associate it with their genomic data, and you could see the correlations you could see from that, and so uh, there might be new types of information that you would be able to get this way. And it would uh, enable genomic social networking. Uh, you already see this with the genealogical things, but time meeting people who have the same genes that you do in some respect. It could be, and you can imagine fun novel stuff that, you know, uh, people, once they get, you know, the opportunity to be imaginative, there's a lot of possibilities. Now, on the other hand, there's obviously a lot of challenges here. Um, first of all, any kind of sharing requires some kind of standardization. Um, so, if you can't interpret the meaning of the data from one place to another, then you, you can't, um, you can't uh, you know, work with the data because you won't be able to make those interpretations. 
Um, there are systems problems. Like, for example, you, know, you saw earlier I had a little DNA on the phone and a big DNA in the cloud. There are going to be data processing differentiations. It'll probably need to be like a three or four tier system with very heavyweight data in one place, you know, uh, whole genome sequencing data in another place that's derived from that, and then you know, parts of that that would exist in other places. There's a reliability and accuracy issue. Um, I think this is not as serious as one might think because we know very well how to keep the data partitioned so that you don't get mixed up and it has a label as to where it came from and can be digitally checked. Um, you need to deal with views and information overload. Parties don't want to get you know, inundated with data that they weren't intending to have because then they become responsible for it. And so this is another thing you can do very well with the computers is you can give clear, restricted views of data so that you're only responsible for certain parts. Okay. And then privacy and information flow, that's probably going to be the hardest problem, which is why I was attracted to this one part, is you know, how do you make sure this information goes where you expect it to go? As people write apps and put them on the system, how are you going to make sure the privacy of the people involved uh, is respected uh, to keep the partitioning so that the wrong types of data are not used by apps uh, and so on. Okay, so uh, that's that's it. I um, I did want to leave a couple of concluding leads with you. Like I said, we're kind of at the beginning of the project here, so we're going to start, you know, doing detailed design and building in, in due course, and we're kind of on a requirements phase now. I've already had some enjoyable conversations with the Mayo folks about what they think requirements for systems like these might look like. The project's called Thaw, and we have this great URL, thaw.org. Um, <laughs> It's one of our biggest achievements so far. Um, and, um, and then I, I wanted to teach you something, too. That's a, a condensed Google URL. And so you see the GL. Does anybody know what GL is as an extension? Nobody? Oh, good. Then everybody will learn. That's the Greenland extension, <laughs> which, which also, according to what I read on the web, stands for good luck. And so you can get uh, you know, whatever domain name you want. So Google got goo.gl. So Z-I-C-T-T -T is a little survey of ours. We enjoy feedback uh, from you on uh, privacy interests with respect to genomic data. Another great talk. Thank you very much, Carl. And let's give a round of applause for all three speakers. And I don't know if you've noticed this, there's not just three speakers up here, there's also a fly yes. that's been jumping around and entertaining us throughout the talk. So, round of, no, just kidding, not a round of applause for the fly. All right, we're gonna transition now to the, the, the uh, editorial conversation part of the, of the session here. Where people, I'm assuming there's some, there's some questions here, are these the preloaded or are these from the audience? Okay, so we were able to get the Wi-Fi going. Uh, so why don't we just jump right in, and the questions are coming up on this monitor here, so if I'm reading the question and I'm not paying attention to my, uh, to my speakers here, it's not because I'm intentionally trying to ignore them. I'm just trying to read off of the screen here. So uh, the question at the top came up as, when do we move away from thinking of ordering a gene test versus a gene analysis? Or in other words, why not do the sequencing once and then the analysis several times? And Heidi, that's probably most appropriate for you. So I can say that we actually do this today. We run gene tests and then the physician comes back at least once a year and says, do you understand anything more about that variant of uncertain significance or do you still think that's likely pathogenic? Um, and now we've launched an automated system to communicate with the physicians and in real time when we change a variant classification to give them that updated information um, so that they know it th when it happens and can adjust care for the patient. So in some ways, we already do this today. We've sequenced once we, for years to come, we uh, continue to interpret. But, but if we think about that in the broader sense, you know, should I, people will say, should I just get my exome or genome sequenced today? Um, and then, you know, it'll be there for me. And, and that's where I come back to this issue of, of not full quality in terms of what we have access today and that there's gaps and holes and variants that aren't called accurately. And we, 
you know, there's a lot of good data there, but it's not perfect. And so, you know, somebody asked me, do I want my sequence done? And I said, well, if I got it for free, I'd do it today. But if I had to pay $5,000, <laughs> I'm not paying today. And I'm going to wait until I actually need it, and then I'll pay that at that point. Because I know that, you know, in a year from now, the technology will be better, and a year after that, it'll be better. So I think we're in this sort of, you know, juncture where there's, there is utility for certain situations. And, and we make use of this, and I certainly support that. But we're not perfect yet, and there will be improvements. And so it's sort of picking that sweet spot. Great, thank you. Uh, that question actually came up yesterday. We did a clinomics or a omics 101 session uh, before the official kickoff of the, of the meeting here, and that exact same question mm -hmm. came up. Should I just get my genome now and use it forever and ever? Yeah. And I think the same, the same perspective was shared at the end of the day as the the technology's good, mm -hmm. but it's not perfect. Right. In five years from now, you may not want the same genome right. or people making medical decisions off the same genome. So yeah. mm -hmm. at least we're consistent. That's right. right. <laughs> Frank, a question for you. Um, you know, you and I have had a lot of conversations about uh, clinical utility being extremely important for uh, launching a new diagnostic test. And that's very simple when you're talking about a specific analyte. You start going into multiplex testing, though, and larger and larger panels, ultimately getting to the point of the exome. What do we have to do in order to get to the point where we feel comfortable saying there is clinical utility in exome sequencing? Is that now in some cases, or have we still not really fully defined that utility? Well, I'll qualify myself by saying I'm a microbiologist, so our genomes are very, very small and of not great <laughs> consequence, not like Homo sapiens. But I've learned a lot from, from our group here in the department about this. And if I, and I'll say this and you can challenge this, but certainly uh, with your Odyssey patients, you know, if you see, uh, if you go through the current state of the art of sequencing, the quality that it is, is it's a, there's a chance you'd make a hit or two. And then you can verify that uh, or validate that with kindred analysis as well. Mm -hmm. So that might be useful. Um, for the um, somatic, the cancer, that's a whole other world. And uh, it gets into all sorts of issues related to specimen quality and where did you get the biopsy and is it the primary, is it the metastasis? It's not like a genome that's soluble that you're taking out of the blood for, for inheritable. So that's a little bit more challenging. But um, if I play the, so you asked me the clinical, yeah, again, if you, if you go through a process of clinical validation, and we need some help with that, what is proper clinical validation, but I think we're getting more input from a variety of groups, and so that there's some standardized approach, that'll lead to better understanding of what we need that's a lack in technology, what do we need as far as um, calling a, you know, a, a variant a true variant or not, if you're as standardized as possible. I think the information and the informatics would want a standardized approach. So uh, we're, we're, we're getting there. Um, I'm kind of playing the FDA role here, but mm -hmm. not really, because I do not represent the FDA. <laughs> but we do historically from even a potassium or a single analyte, if we don't do it right and we don't validate it, we can really harm the patient. So uh, we have to make sure that what we're doing is uh, uh, not harming the patient is safe. And uh, I know uh, I gave you some examples, but that's my, my opinion. Well, I don't you. think I answered your question, because I. No, 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 I think absolutely. And I think there, there's another piece in there as well, um, that the, the exome and the genome at some level is just a reagent, right? And so if we're interpreting a focused panel, like a foundation medicine panel or a limited panel, uh, it becomes a different question. Yeah. But uh, I was specifically asking about interpreting the whole thing, and that's well, what you answered. One thing that, uh, that we've talked about in our research group, and um, you know, uh, Matt's group presents to the executive committee, this is so important in our enterprise that he comes all the way up and we pick on him, and we all have <laughs> divide, diverse backgrounds. I'm sore, but, too. <laughs> you're sore. Uh, but where I look at uh, you know, whole exome as probably a first step is where you know a lot of the, the, the uh, targets and they've been validated, and you're using multiple different probes you're enriching by PCR. It's the old-fashioned method. Maybe even it's better than arrays, where you're looking at that, that it's a replacement technology. 
that that has great needs. So I think pharmacokinetics, I think pharmacogenetics, I think we know a lot there. And you're going to reach a point where that technology is going to replace the old multiple mm -hmm. target analysis. And that's where you can validate it fairly easy, like you've done with the gene panel for colon cancer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's replacement. Uh, that's not making a med medical need where there's not nothing before, like uh, let's say uh, the whole the total genome with uh, the Odyssey patients. That's a medical it's funny. need. We look like a bunch of Italians up here yeah, with the <laughs> swat the and fly. the flyaway as it's flying around. That's great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Carl. You know, I, I like the idea of uh, cloud computing, cloud storage of information, um, but in, in, in the health field, there just seems to be a, a visceral and natural negative reaction to cloud computing. I, my, my sons like to play on their Sony PlayStation, and a lot of that information is stored on the cloud, and we know that that was hacked because uh, our username came up and it said that we had bought a bunch of services that I know the boys aren't uh, involved in yet, but so how do we... <laughs> So how do we get to a point? How old are those boys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Se seven and nine. Oh, okay. A babysitter. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we get to a point where we can really understand the risk out there and really make maximal use of this space? Because, you, you know, as we collect all of these genomes, we can't store the data locally ourselves. We'd have to build another Mayo Clinic footprint and house it just with servers and computers. How do we get to that point? I think an important thing is improving the technologies, the confidence we can put in the technology in all the levels that you know have vulnerabilities now. So we, we've been quite good about making hardware cheap and reliable, the hardware. Uh, but areas where we've been you know, more challenged are uh, the security privacy guarantees um, and the uh, reliability uh, of um, uh, the software. and. Uh, and then uh, there's also a, a legal level uh, of uh, data use agreements and, and these sorts of things that need to uh, allow parties to feel confident that their data can be held. I think a thing to recognize, though, that these, um, think of a, a physician's office with six physicians. Then they don't have the staff you know, to have an IT specialist there but they could outsource their uses to parties that have world-leading experts that do security. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and so it could be uh, that the safer thing to do will be the outsourcing in due course, mm -hmm. provided the right kinds of parties you know, exist and the right kinds of agreements and the right kind of business understandings. I, I was in a meeting um, with um, high ups in a, a major hospital, and they were discussing whether they should consider cloud computing to save money or, you know, share data more easily. <coughs> and, you know, the question was, well, what if the party that is hosting my data goes bankrupt? And so it's not just, you know, the, uh, the technical questions, mm -hmm. but also, you know, questions of business reliability and mm -hmm. what kind of agreements would they be. And these are institutions, you know, that take care of people's lives. And so they have to have very high confidence uh, in these things. I, this is the kind of thing that attracts me because, you know, you see in the past there were technologies we wouldn't consider uh, using, and then over time they got better. I, I do like cars, actually. I, have, I just got a car that has... Um, the question just surprised me. It has adaptive cruise control. Oh, nice. Which is this technology to keep you from running into the car in front of yeah. you. And it works astoundingly well. But ten, <laughs> ten years ago, I wouldn't have even considered letting a computer you know, make a judgment like that. I mean, working in the computer right. area, I think of the right. crazy people who yeah. would let a computer make that decision. <laughs> and, and so over time, you know, it, it got to be the case that we could have confidence in things that we didn't used to have. Great. Uh, just a quick follow-up question on that. Uh, I, was, I was curious uh, to get your perspective on the perception of status quo security versus this idea of cloud security. You know, in the laboratory, we have tests that we consider the quote unquote gold standard, but that doesn't mean that they're the best test ever. And is it similar with security as well, where if a really savvy hacker wanted to get in behind, beyond the firewall of the Mayo Clinic, could they do so much like they could access the cloud environment? Well, I imagine Mayo has uh, very good uh, security and uh, attacks from outsiders are probably very rare. Um, 
I, I would guess that uh, one of the biggest threat for hospitals typically is insider threats. Mm. So you have to have a large number of people uh, within the hospital uh, that get access. And so when you think of WikiLeaks and Snowden and so yeah, on, yeah. Then, then you know this is a, a new type of threat, which is if you allow a lot of employees, you, you create a barrier and you protect the barrier very well. So they say it's crunchy on the outside and soft and gooey on the inside. Yeah. Yeah. And so then you have someone on the inside and then that wrecks everything. And, yeah. and so the screening that you would have to do with employees is probably the weak point. Mm. Uh, and uh, hospitals are particularly sharing because once the people are on the inside, they're very trusted, and the costs of someone not getting information they need when they need it is very high, potentially. And so that hospitals you know, become the ultimate GUI on the inside, yeah. and so that's where a lot of the threat has been for hospitals. Well, thank you, great, great. Okay, so uh, Heidi, the question coming up here is for you. Regarding the variant classification change leading to abortion, did you notify the clinician and patient regarding the change in variant classification once you found out? And what's your institution's policy on reporting those changes? How did this case affect that position? So we actually found out about the outcome because we did call that um, physician to relay the new information. And when we did that, we, I mean, we anticipated there had to have been some sort of outcome because the patient had been pregnant and this was beyond nine months later. Um, so yes, we immediately relayed that information, and that is our policy when we're thinking about variants that we've reported as pathogenic and then learned that they're benign, or vice versa. We reported them as benign and learned that they're pathogenic. I think the challenge for many laboratories is we report a lot of things in the gray and the uncertain significance, and almost no laboratory has the resources to call out these incremental changes. Well, we learned a little bit more, and now we're almost to likely pathogenic, or we learned, you know, and so we have, we just can't handle that sort of gray zone, and we, on all of our reports, say, you know, contact us every year to get an update. Now, this new software system that we've put out allows us to deliver that information in real time without any sort of manual conveyance, and that has solved that problem and um, for any of the clinics that have this software solution in place, uh, and we're working on rolling that out to more of our clinics. But I would argue that this is a major problem across all laboratories, is how to you know, continually uh, update information, get it out to patients and physicians so that it can be used in, in changes in care. And, and our data suggests that 4% of cases per year have a, uh, what we classify as a medium to high alert in terms of knowledge mm -hmm. change. So mm -hmm. this is not a rare event. Uh, you know, the outcome like that is more rare, but, but the actual knowledge change is not rare. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was at a, a conference about four years ago, and we were speaking with a group of physicians, and the, the idea from the laboratory was really starting to get in line with this constant updating yeah. of the variants as it came through. But the physicians that were receiving that message were coming back and saying, whoa, wait a minute. I don't know if I want to be responsible for that change. I don't know if I'm still taking care of that mm -hmm. patient or following that patient. I really feel like this is a problem that needs to be solved so that, you know, getting, blending a little bit of all of what we we're talking about here today, the informatics, making sure these things are following the, the patient as they move from region to region across the country, uh, the regulatory, an environment to make sure that we're not breaking any rules or doing anything incorrectly by letting that information transfer. But mm -hmm. I think we have to get to that point. And if our physicians don't feel comfortable with that, then we've not given them the right tools to really take up that knowledge. But knowledge is going to be changing all the time. And we have to create an environment where we can update interpretations, especially with the case yeah. that you shared here. And we are, you know, we've now integrated this software system into the partner's electronic health record. But it is a challenge because the, the physician who ordered a test is not necessarily the physician who cares for that patient over their right. lifetime. It may be a specialist, That's right. a consult, or something like that. And so we've been working to really get this integrated into the EHR environment so that any physician, you know, looking at that case has access to that knowledge. And even now discussing pushing out the data source into the patient gateway system, mm -hmm. which is partners uh, patient access, to, to allow a patient to know that this information has been updated, even if a physician is not monitoring and being proactive about it. We haven't done that yet, but this is something that is under discussion. That's great, great. Uh, so let's see. Uh, 
Dr. Cockerell, mm -hmm. lifetime achievement, Madonna or Lady Gaga? <laughs> well, you know, we could talk about that over a coffee because oh, yeah. I think, you know, different styles and, uh, and now you've got Miley, she's trying, but um, maybe she's going to be a contender. Seriously, though, so we have a question here. Uh, could, th could you reiterate the differences uh, between IVD and LDTs? Yeah. What determines when a test must be FDA regulated? Are there ways for labs to voluntarily undergo more rigorous FDA regulation than might be legally required? Okay, so who's ever responsible for these, I see that they disappear once you start answering them. So don't, there are three questions there, and I'm an old guy, so don't. <laughs> okay, first one, I'm gonna be very general and not uh, specific related to the regs, but the difference between an in vitro diagnostic and an LDT. Um, basically, if you're putting together a test, and I'll say in a kit form, and you're going to sell that to someone who's gonna do the testing, that's regulated by the FDA as an in vitro diagnostic. And you've all heard about these long, drawn out uh, studies. Um, Ted Lazarus is here, and he did the HPV study, the Roche 8. PV study, the clinical outcomes, and how many thousands were evaluated at 30? Uh, 14,000 in one and 44,000 in the other. So very rigorous clinical outcome that you propose what you're going to do, the FDA evaluates where you are with those trials and says, do you have to do more? Because when Tad had that test, let's say at Roche, and then it's vended, he's not overseeing the day-to-day -day operation of that test. It's done by qualified people, but we're accepting that and we're not modifying that and we didn't go through the extensive validation of that kit. So an IVD, you're selling. It's a, it's a commodity, it's sold. Laboratory developed tests, we can't, IVD companies can't develop all the tests that we have. We have around 4,000 unique tests at Mayo Medical Laboratories. So many of those are LDTs. They, they serve an unmet need that the volume is low um, and you know, no one's going to uh, do an IVD with those. So those laboratory developed tests then fall under all that discussion I told you. Now, the next part of this is, what determines when a test must be FDA regulated? Well, LDTs are FDA regulated. Hello. Um, so, and we actually fall under the QSRs that the IVD companies follow. But the FDA has been somewhat discretionary in looking at people, how they're doing it, because remember, You've got these tests in your lab, but you have qualified personnel. It's the practice of medicine. Um, it's not just that you're producing something that you're selling. So they've, I can't speak for the FDA, but CMS, New York State, has assumed some of this oversight, CAP, all that to make sure that the quality of the tests are there. So we are regulated, and what's coming out any moment is a guidance, FDA guidance for LDTs. And we don't know if that's going to be completely the same as IVD or somewhere, IVD or somewhere in between. Are there ways for labs to voluntarily undergo more rigorous FDA regulation than might be legally required? O-M-G, who <laughs> is that? I mean, it's like, it's, like, it's like Lady Gaga asking for a critic to come up and she, they said she did a great job and tell me I was bad. Well, basically, I'm sorry, I'm being a little bit critical here. No, but I'm saying we are regulated. You, if, you, if you do an LDT route or an IVD, you fall under the FDA regulations for test development. And so those are QSRs. Look them up. They're there. And the FDA can come in any time. But I don't know what you're volunteering to do at a higher level. Maybe that question was, can I do an IVD? Yes, you can. If you want to sell that, it's currently at a higher level of scrutiny, and you can develop an IVD if you want to sell that kit. I think I answered all those. All right, well, we're actually out of time. Thank you very much. How about a round of applause for our group?